Welcome to People Love Process. Now, before I jump into this movie, I just want to call out that I'm just getting over a cold, so my voice is a, a little deeper than it normally is. And it sounds cool, but uh, that might throw you off because my voice is never that deep when I'm recording. Um, I kind of wish it was. It's kind of like a radio voice. So um, pardon me uh, with my voice, but let's go ahead and jump into this. Uh, part of being a creative is developing design resources you can use within your projects, whether it's just personal artwork or a client project. It doesn't matter. It's always important to experiment and try new things. And that's kind of why I started creating this watercolor set is I wanted to see what I could do with these type of textures within the context of Illustrator. So in this movie, I'm going to show you watercolor textures I created. This is five of them shown here and how you can use them within Adobe Illustrator to compose a design that captivates the aesthetic of a watercolor motif. So let's jump into this. The easiest way to think about uh, these textures is that they're grayscale TIFF images. They're all created at extremely high PPI, uh, 1200 PPI to be exact. And this means it has incredible detail. So if I go ahead and zoom in on this, you can see we're zoomed in like almost 600%. You can see how detailed it looks. And even where the pigment kind of pools on the edge, we'll be talking about that more in a little bit. But these are really easy to use because all you have to do uh, to utilize um, a, a texture like this inside Illustrator is just click on it. And then in this case, we're just going to color it this pink color and it fills what's black or the black base pixels with this color. Now, white, because it's a because it's a grayscale TIFF, isn't transparent like it would be on a bitmap TIFF, where white is considered transparent, and when you place it into Illustrator, uh, nothing's there. In this case, this is still white, but it only colors uh, the black pixels. So that's kind of cool. Now, you can also adjust it. I want to adjust the, the value of this, because right now it's at 100%. I want to knock it down by half to 50 like that. And then as you use other textures, you can also select them and apply a blend mode. In this case, we won't do it for this one, but the next one we will. So let's go ahead and turn on this layer and we'll align this with our design. You can see it covers the other one because white in a, a grayscale image is going to be opaque. To, to utilize it and interact with the... Um, the other texture, you'd want to go to a blend mode like multiply, and then that way it will show through and interact with the other texture. Now, with this one still selected, we're going to color this one blue, and you can see where the two uh, watercolor textures overlap is creating that nice kind of uh, purple aspect going on, and that's the beauty of this. But it can be as simple as this. We might knock the value on this one down. Let's go from 100 to 85 like that and I think that looks fine so you could do something as simple like this and then drop a design you might have on top of it and it serves as the background uh, for this design motif so this is a simple way you can use it what I want to show you is a little more complex but it's not hard anybody can do this so let's jump into that and our theme for this is going to be a western theme a distinctly western theme uh, uh, based off a uh, longhorn and we have a longhorn skull here you can see me inking um, now I am going to show you that yes I'm analog inking uh, you can do all of this digitally too if you prefer doing that that's fine I'm going to show you uh, why that is in just a second but I like going to analog because it's right there um, I have my reference and I'm, I've already worked out my drawing. And so now I'm just filling it in, basically. All I'm trying to do when I ink it like this, whether you ink it uh, analog, whether you ink it digitally, is I just want it to have an organic edge. I don't want it to be perfect, clean, smooth lines. Um, I want this to, you know, kind of bump around and get, I don't know, wobbly. I don't know if wobbly is the best way to describe it, but uh, a more organic edge that feels uh, 
kind of less computer driven, if you will. So that's how I created that. Of course, I look at reference. I take a little artistic uh, license. Long horns can have really long horns. This one doesn't really have that long a horn, so I exaggerated it. Actually, come to think about it, it might not even be a long horn <laughs> that I, I grabbed this reference from. So I just elongated it and took a creative license, took my inking, scanned it in with my flatbed scanner, and then that way I can bring it into Illustrator and image trace it to get the final result. Now I'm gonna show you how to image trace in just a second, but that's how I created the skull. So once again, whether you draw it out in analog first or you prefer doing it digitally, because you could do the exact same thing in a digital workflow by simply, maybe you scan in your, uh, your sketch or your, um, you take the source photograph and you push it to your iPad. I usually use Dropbox. That's the easiest way to get it on my iPad. And then I'll place it in Adobe Fresco on Illustrator and then use a vector brush to do my inking. Now, the only drawback against that is that when you push it back to the desktop to work with it in Illustrator on the desktop, um, all of those shapes won't fuse together kind of like the blob brush does in Illustrator. They'll be independent. So you'll have to select everything, unite it, and then clean it up. So uh, that should be expected. But whether you want to do it in analog or digital, either way is fine. You pick the way that works best for you. So I also have typography I want to work in this, and this will sit on top of the Longhorn Skull. And so I just look for a nice condensed font and tried to find one that is Western. I didn't really have one, uh, but I found this is listed under Gothic. And I really don't like the serifs or the inner treatment, but I like the, the, the kind of condensed letter form shape. So again, much like the skull, I'm going to go back to analog and draw out these letter forms. And I'm kind of matching that looseness on the edge to give that organic quality, but I'm simplifying and making it distinctly look more Western. I think this inner detail kind of helps with that. Uh, you can see I didn't like the G, so I'll draw out all the letter forms until I get it looking just the way I want. And once again, scan that in. And so when I'm inside of Illustrator, I have a TIFF. So now we're going to go ahead and use Image Trace. Let's go ahead and open that up. And with Image Trace open, I'll select my type. And you want to make sure to go ignore white because any white area in your image that you're tracing, it'll make that a shape filled with white if you don't do that. And we don't want that. So make sure to turn that on. And I'm going to trace this as tight as I can. So on paths, I'm going to go all the way to high at 100%. And on noise, I'm going to pull it all the way to the left. I'll go ahead and leave the, the middle corners one as is. And that's all we need to do. And we're going to click trace. It's traced it, and now you have to expand it to get access. And we're going to click expand in the top menu here. And we can close the, the image trace panel now. And you can see it traced it. You can see we have a couple artifacts. So I'm going to go ahead and get rid of those. Just select those and delete them. Now, if we zoom in on these, you're going to see these are just an insane amount of anchor points. And um, one reason why I love using Astute Graphics plugin is because it gives me a readout showing me how many anchor points are in any given object selected. And we have almost 6,000 in this. That's way too much. So uh, we're going to leave, we're going to stay zoomed in like this. But what I want to do is I want to go to object. I want to pull down to path. And I want to go to simplify. And we'll open up the simplify controls. I really don't like that it defaults. Uh, to this. This isn't horrible, but I'm going to click into the full menu because I like controlling this myself rather than Illustrator deciding to do it for me. And here, I want to bring this down to, I don't know, let's see what that looks like. That looks pretty good. And I think, I think we're going to leave it there. I just noticed this. I don't remember this being here. Retain my latest settings and directly open this dialog. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm going to do that. That way 
I guess that means it won't show me what I saw. We'll see. Uh, but those are the settings. I'll click OK. So instead of 6,000 now, we have about 1,360, which is fine. So we'll click that. So that's how I'd simplify that. Now, I'm always paying attention to the appearance panel where I'm working on things because right now this typography is a group. So I want to change that to a compound uh, compound path. Now, I use keyboard shortcuts every time I do certain things that are up in the menu pull downs because it's just slower doing that. So, if I wanted to make a compound path, I'd go up to object with it selected, go down to compound paths, go over and click make. Notice I have F7 because that's all I do is I just select it. Notice it's a group here and I just hit F7. Now it's a compound. Never have to go to the menu. I do that for, on so many things. Uh, so if you want to know more about that, just watch my uh, keyboard shortcuts movie on this channel, and that'll demystify it for you. And I think it'll also convince you you need to set up your own because it just speeds up the workflow a lot. So this uh, methodology of hand drawing the type, hand drawing the skull, I do that even for the secondary elements. So here's just the elements typed out with the font I had. This was pulled from a, a design I saw in a blurry photograph and I just crudely built it knowing that I'll just redraw it to look better. And so you can see over here, I drew this star out so it's imperfect. I drew the typography kind of using the proportion of this typeface but made it look more, I don't know, cowboyish, I guess. Um, and then this uh, ornamental motif, I dialed that in here. So all these are going to play a part in the final design. And if I turn on the base design, you can see how they all come together. Now, all of these are separate individual elements, whether it's a skull, the longhorn type, the elements on top, the established date. Uh, the only thing here I didn't draw in the fashion I showed you is the Austin, Texas. This was an existing font I have that works really well with the aesthetic here. And all the other elements, all of these are going to be used as masks. We're not going to colorize these. We're going to colorize our watercolor and use these to mask everything. And the colors we're going to use is almost like sepia tones. So here, I have the colors on the left. And if I just select this top color, you can see that's only one showing up in my swatches. That's because this is a global color. And when you use global colors, you can go to the color tab and you can adjust what tint you want it. That's what T stands for here. And you can adjust the global colors, uh, the, the tint of that global color on any shape. So if I click on this, you can see I have this one set for 70. I have this one set for 45. And I have this one set for 20. So I just want to point that out because I'm going to be creating tints of some of the colors to get this certain look and feel I want. So I just wanted to walk you through that. And, and the only way you can use tinting, it has to be a global color. It won't work with a raw color. And when I say raw color, like you just have to make sure you have global selected within your swatch options for the given color we're talking about, in this case, the brown, and I have this on. If this is not checked, you won't be able to create a tint of that color. So uh, that's why I'm a big believer in always working global colors. It just makes sense. So let's start applying some of, uh, some of, these, some of these textures. So we're going to do that now. Right now we have this texture that's kind of overlapping uh, the type here, and that's fine. So we're gonna go ahead and fill it with brown like that. And the first thing we wanna do is we want to go ahead and go to transparency, and we're gonna go multiply, and we're just gonna go ahead and copy this. We're gonna select the type, we're gonna go paste behind, Command B. And now this, once again, uh, because it's a compound, we're going to use that type to be the mask for this watercolor texture. So we're going to mask it. F1 is the keyboard shortcut I use. You're going to always get this. And this is where I wish Illustrator, it warns you that, hey, there could be problems with this. This is a complex mask. It's like, but it always works. So I wish they would just say, 
never show me again click box, but they don't. So you're going to have to deal with it. And I just do it anyway. I've never had problems with that. Never ran into problems. You could, in some cases, if it's super complex, uh, I, I think it's basically based off of old, older RIP technology for files. I don't think uh, the, the process for creating final art on an offset press, for example, would struggle with that anymore, but who knows. Uh, but what you get is this really nice effect. Now, the beauty of watercolor is at times areas kind of, uh, kind of wash out into the background and it kind of ebbs and flows and it looks beautiful. And that's kind of what we have here. And I think we're going to improve it even more. So the next one I want to do is this one here. And we're just going to go ahead and bring that one all the way, uh, all the way over like this. And the nice thing about this, let's move this guy over just a little bit. I think that looks better like that is we're going to do the same thing here, but we're going to color it. Uh, the brown color, but I don't want it dark. I want this to look like it was uh, kind of like a wash on the background uh, to uh, just just more of a background, a secondary type of treatment. So this is where we'll go to transparency and we're going to apply 15. And I think that looks good just so it falls to the background. That's all we're doing there. We'll do another one. We're going to take uh, this one here and we're going to bring this one all the way over kind of like this. We'll go ahead and color it brown, adjust the blend mode to multiply so it interacts kind of like that. I think that's that looks pretty good. And this is going to actually let's adjust the opacity. Uh, we don't want it 100. We'll knock off about 60, and that looks good. Now, the reason why I adjusted the opacity in the blend mode is because now where the edge of the other one, you kind of see it going through, and this is what's going to happen when you're actually watercoloring. So um, it just creates more authentic uh, realism in terms of uh, comp composing it here in Illustrator. And basically, that's all we're doing. We're using Illustrator as a staging ground for composition. This isn't vector art other than the mass we created. Um, that's the only vector part of this design. So uh, that's the way I like to use Illustrator. Let's take a look at the big one. And the big one will be going over the bowl. Now, here's where these textures become more flexible because you can see it doesn't actually cover everything uh, you're seeing here. So what am I going to do? Well, I'm just going to scale it up because remember, these are just 1,200 PPI, very forgiving, and they're textures. So by their very nature, they're going to look degraded. Right now, we're at almost 1,200% zoom, and this is super tight. It's like it's going to work fine. So we're just going to scale it larger than what we need. We'll go ahead and we'll color it brown like that. Now, previously, when I did the lettering, you can apply your blend mode to this shape before you mask it. Or you can just mask it like this. In this case, let's go ahead and cut this to the clipboard, paste it, Command-B, behind this mask. Now we're going to select this, and I'm going to mask it. And instead of applying the blend mode or the um, applying... Uh, the blend mode to the the texture image itself then masking it we're going to do the opposite we're going to go ahead and mask this and that looks good but we're going to adjust the blend mode um, on this shape itself so we're going to go ahead and go to multiply that way it multiplies with the other elements so if we go ahead and zoom in here you can see how you can catch it multiplying with the the other element in the background like that, that's fine. Uh, but I don't want this to be 100%. I want this to be a little diminished. So we'll do 80. And I think that looks pretty good. Like that. So this is the principle I'll use to mask all the textures. And when I mask them all, uh, this is what it looks like. And this looks really believable. But there's one thing I want to point out because it's a detail that really captures the essence 
of watercolor, and I want to replicate that using an Illustrator function. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to zoom in on this background. So the background image that's uh, kind of, it was 15% we set it at. Notice where the watercolor pigment, when it comes to the edge of where the water is, the pigment pools and it almost creates an inner glow type effect. And that's what the feature in Illustrator we're going to use to kind of mimic that uh, to make our design more believable. So let's go ahead and turn on this layer and you can see all these elements, whether it's the longhorn type, the skull or the ranch, all of these. This is what we're going to apply an inner glow uh, to this shape uh, to pull it up. So all we're going to do with this select, and by the way, I'll point out again, this is a compound path. We're going to go up here to effect, and we're going to go to stylize, and we're going to go inner glow, and we're going to click on it. That'll bring up the control here. We can go ahead and go to color. We'll select the brown here. This is another thing I wish they improve. Like if there's colors, I wish that color was just showing up in this palette. Make the palette a little bigger. But having to click through stuff is kind of the way Illustrator started. It shouldn't be that way anymore. It should be forward facing, but um, hopefully they'll, they'll do all that eventually. And so now all we're going to do is select the blend mode. We want this to be multiply like that. But on opacity, I don't want the opacity um, to be set in here. I want to control that. So I'm going to go ahead and set it to 100 because I'll adjust the opacity uh, by applying a blend mode, which will get rid of the white and the white won't show up. So that's why I'm doing that. And so now we're going to go ahead and maybe let's let's see what seven looks like. Nope, too much. Oops, I clicked out. Let's double click back in. I think five was fine. We'll just stick with five. That looks good. But you can see how dark it is. That That's too dark. I don't want it that dark. So we're going to go ahead and go to uh, transparency. We're going to set the blend mode to multiply. That gets rid of the white. And I don't want the value of that inner glow to be 100%. We're going to make this a lot more subtle. We're going to knock off 60% and go to 40 like that. And now... If I go in and zoom in on this, you can see how much more believable that looks in terms of being watercolored as if it's pooling on the edge of those shapes. Now, I do the same thing on smaller detail like the star and stuff. I have inner glow, but I just made those smaller since those elements are smaller so it wouldn't eat up the, the surface of those. And I think this is working really well. Now, the last thing I'm going to do to kind of push over the top is I'm going to go back and use textures. Now, I love creating textures. Uh, they work great. Here's a texture that was derived from old emulsion plates uh, that a friend of mine found in an old uh, photography studio, sent them to me, and I created this with it. So all I want to do here is I want this to look gritty, kind of imperfect, and have subtle artifacting, not overt. I wouldn't do it black. And I wouldn't leave it 100% brown after I colored it. But on this one, we're going to knock it back quite a bit. We're going to go to just 20% like that. And then we want to make sure that we multiply it. So whatever it's overlapping, it's multiplying with. So if we zoom in, you can see the nice artifacting. It's just dropping in. It just adds that character uh, that looks really nice. Now, one thing with watercolor is if you have specks of water that land on something that's even already dry, it'll kind of eat through that pigment. And it adds a nice characteristic to watercolor. So we're going to kind of do the same thing. Now, when I created these watercolor, uh, watercolor set, I also took an a, a old toothbrush, dipped it in the black watercolor paint, uh, not so watered down for this and just splattered it on paper to create what you see here. And so this is a bitmap TIFF. This is where the white background of a bitmap TIFF by default is transparent. 
and now we're just going to color this white. Now, we wouldn't want to leave it like this because this either looks like it's snowing in Texas or I got really bad dandruff. Uh, I don't want either of those things being reflected. So we're going to keep it white, but I'm going to adjust the opacity so it's a lot more subtle uh, to 45 turn it on and I think that looks really, really cool. So uh, the watercolor textures used in this movie are saved once again at 1200 PPI. So they are high definition assets. I did that to make them more flexible so you can scale up if needed. You could even blow these up a lot larger and they're gonna, they're just gonna look great. So you can access the exercise files for this movie via the link in the description below. Uh, the download includes a complete set of watercolor textures you can use within your own projects. Uh, best part about resources like this is they are timeless and will never go out of style, so you can use them for a lifetime of creativity. If you like this movie, please consider sharing a link uh, to my YouTube channel on your social media account. I'd really appreciate that. That'll help me to continue creating this level of content. And please like and subscribe as well. Thank you for watching People Love Process. I hope this content helps you improve your own creative process.